we've been discussing prayer, and I think it's important as we discuss prayer, and we look at prayer, that we talk about praying for a group. We've looked at prayers for a lot of individual needs and reasons. Whether those were times of struggle, whether they're times of need, whether they're times of pain or sorrow, whether they're times of feelings of loss, whether they're times that we've made mistakes and we need to repent, different kinds of prayers. But today we're going to look at, as we celebrate graduation and friends and family, praying for each other, praying as a church, praying as a family, praying as a group. If you may have noticed, there's an exciting event going on in Pittsburgh sports right now. The Pittsburgh Penguins are in a fight for Lord Stanley's Cup. Now, for those of you that follow hockey, this is probably one of the most exciting Stanley Cup finals I've watched in a long time. And for many of you, you were hoping the other night that there was going to be an enormous celebration in Pittsburgh. So much so that about 40,000 people gathered in Pittsburgh, in the arena and on the streets, to host the Cup. But it didn't happen. Why did it happen? Well, there's a lot of reasons it didn't happen, but if you talk to the players, most of the time they'll say, well, our team skills weren't as good tonight as they needed to be to win. When we look at church growth, we look at family of fellowship, when we look at the life of being Christians, I think there's a lot of comparisons to a sports team. See, in the church, we have forwards and we have defensemen. We have people that are really good playing center ice, and we have ones that are really good at the puck drop and getting it to our side of the field. We have goalies, we have captains, we have coaches. But if we look at the general thing, I think we have the ultimate goalie, the person that stops everything that happens. We have the ultimate coach, and we have the ultimate captain of God the Father, Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit that are with us. So today we're going to look at Paul's words to the church in Ephesians in his opening chapter, his opening monologue, if you will, to the church on prayer. And as he looks at that church, as he speaks to the church, he talks to them about how they should live for each other. And Paul's prayers and his words for them in a time where he wants them to come together and know each other. And it's important that we understand in that timing, in that word, in that will, how Paul's words for us work. So if you'd like to follow along in there, Scripture comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, starting in verse 15. And this is what is written. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength He exerted when He raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under His feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. And let us pray. Dear Father, we come to you this morning and ask that you would be with us and guide us, that you will lift us up in your hands. That Father, in the hearing and the reading of your word, you would help us to gain wisdom from it. That Father, today, in this time and this place, we would understand your words and your will for us. We pray these things in your name, Father. We come this morning with Paul's words to us. And my opening point is this. Your faith is contagious and your faith will spread. We talk about our New Hope City Center in Washington, PA. You've heard me talk about it a little bit maybe, but it's a new mission center that our presbytery is developing in Washington. And one of the themes that we have there is that faith is contagious. And once you catch the disease... 
you can't get rid of it. Because once you have faith, once you have Jesus Christ in your heart, there's nothing you can do to make it go away. Not because we can't try, but because God won't let us. So we look today at Paul's opening words for us today. And he says that same thing. I have heard about your faith. Those are pretty awesome words for Paul to give to the church. I know I were the church in this time especially, in a community that was full of turmoil, that the challenge around was, can we survive our faith? And Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote a letter and says, I have heard about you. What encouragement. But Paul follows and he says, because I have heard about you, I am praying for you continually. And hence the thought and the theme for our message today. See, Paul had a lot on his plate. Paul was starting churches all over the region he lived in. From Jerusalem, he traveled all about Asia Minor with his ultimate goal ending in the city of Rome. Church after church. Paul himself was challenged in his daily life. Whether it was being beaten or thrown in jail, Paul had a daily task of himself taking care of the things he needed to do. Of himself making it to the next day. So Paul had plenty going on. Plenty in his own life that I think he could have pretty much filled up 24 hours praying for Paul. But he's clear to the church in Ephesus. Since I have heard about you, since I know your faith is moving, I have been praying for you. Our opening thought today. Do we as members of a church, as members of the Christian faith, I want to use the church in a different, little different setting that we'll get to in a little bit, but do we, as Christians, pray for one another continually? Just a question as we go through this today. See, Paul continues on in verse 16, talking about giving thanks. He wants the church to understand why he's praying for them. And he's thanking God that the church is there, that the church is strong. He's thanking them that they can continue on serving and sharing the message of hope that is an understanding of the church in faith that goes with it. And we need to understand that in our faith lives. We need to understand that as we continue on in the challenges of what is before us. It's not easy to be the church. And when we talk in this building, in worship, in the time of Sunday morning service, you'll hear us talk about being the church, going out from these walls, sharing the message of hope, of grace, and of faith outside of this building. And that is where the challenge comes, is it not? See, I've always felt on Sunday morning it's easy to be ourselves. We're surrounded by a family of faith and people that want to see the best in us, that want to help us be the best we can be, that want to help us be who we are. I know as a kid, growing up in church, they gave me the opportunity to preach at 12, 13, 14 years old. And my guess is they weren't the most riveting sermons at that age. But the church was there to support. The church was there to pray with us. The church was there to lift us up. We saw the same in friends of mine that grew up playing music, guitars, or instruments. Maybe the church was there to support them at sporting events, or the church showed up to be with them and guide them. The same should be true in the church today. And so Paul wants us to remember to give thanks for each other, to remember each other in prayer that as we move forward, we understand that He is with us. So therefore, because Paul is thankful that people have come to know him, to know Jesus Christ, because Paul is thankful that the church is growing and living, he wants us to remember to pray for it. To pray for one another, to pray for the guidance and the growth of the church. But Paul continues on in verse 17 to 19, and I think he gives us some practical things that we can look back on. Paul names four very specific things that he prays for the church. The first of those verses is for wisdom and revelation. Now think about that. If we would pray for each other daily, for each of our brothers and sisters in faith to have wisdom and revelation, what would that mean to you as somebody receiving those prayers? 
How does that make you feel if you're at work, if you're at home, if you're at the shopping mall or you're at a store? If you're confronted with somebody on a question of faith, would you feel better knowing that 80 other people were praying for you that you would have the wisdom and the knowledge to answer the questions properly? I know I would. I know that this church that Paul's talking to is probably relieved in thinking, we're trying to share the gospel, but we don't always know the right answers. But now we know that Paul is praying for us for wisdom daily. What an encouragement to the church. He prays for them to be enlightened. For God to open His eyes to them. For them to be able to read the words of Scripture, to read the Gospel, to hear the prayers, to talk to people, and to be enlightened to the work and the will of the Holy Spirit. Again, imagine the impact we make praying for one another in those times, especially for wisdom and enlightenment. How much better prepared are we for life when we know that God is working in us? And that's not to say He doesn't anyway. God always works in us. But the impact of prayer can be felt in those times. Paul continues on. He prays that the church would know the same hope that he knows in the life and the work of Jesus Christ. We should want to know that hope. We should want to know exactly where God is calling us to. And friends, some of us are going through dark times. Whether we're seeing illness affect us directly or for a family member. Imagine the church right now in Florida. As they're sitting there surrounded by death and destruction. We should be praying for that church that they see hope. That they understand the work and the will of a living, loving God. Because in that, they see things moving forward. We heard the Syrians as they came as Ivan talked to us. He said how grateful he was that the church around the world was praying that the church in Syria would understand the hope of God eternal. Pray for hope. What an awesome thing for us to know that we're surrounded by brothers and sisters praying for us to have hope. He says that we would understand the power of Jesus Christ. The fourth point is maybe one of the more important ones. That in our life, and our weakness, and our challenges day to day, that as people are praying for us, we would feel and understand the power of the work and the worship of Jesus Christ in our lives. How many of you have had a day that everything seems bad? I've been there. How many of you have had days that say, I can't do this anymore? To feel the power of Jesus Christ because people are praying for us and change who we are. Understanding the power and the work and worship of Jesus Christ in our lives is the most powerful thing that we can ask for one another. Paul tells us in this scripture to pray for one another. To get in the huddle and support our teammates. To lift each other up. Whether things are going great and we're ready to pick up the Stanley Cup. Or whether things are going really bad and we've just lost a miserable game five. We need to pray for each other and lift one another in prayer. Because we can support each other. Even though it may not be physically. We can support each other each and every day. So, the last part Paul says, God will answer you because He already has. And I've heard that question when people pray and say, well, I don't know if God's answering me. And I always say, He absolutely is. Maybe you haven't seen it yet, but God already answered our prayers. God proved it because God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live with us, but He didn't stop there. God said, Son, you have to go to the cross. And when Jesus did, He went on the cross, and the Father allowed Him to be crucified. But God answered, and He raised Jesus Christ up from the dead three days later. And in that power, in that resurrection, our prayers have been answered. And God continues to answer them faithfully every time we ask. So Paul's encouragement today to the church in Ephesus as he begins his letter is first of all saying, Have faith. I am praying for you continually. And we should have that same response to our brothers and sisters around us. When we see people on the street, day in and day out, as we go out and we serve and we are the church, we should look at them. And if we don't have time to talk, we should at least walk over and start saying, bless you, I'm praying for you. 
I had a great aunt that used to say to me, every time we saw her as a family in the store, she would walk up to us and she would say, I pray for you every day. We need prayer warriors that do that. We each need to pray for one another. Because in the end, we don't all know what each other are facing. Our days are different. Our days are challenged. Today we celebrated graduates. We have four from this church and hundreds around the communities that are going off into the next phase of life. For each and every one of them, life is going to change. For years, whether it was high school or college, they knew a routine. Every day was the same. That routine is now different. We need to pray for our graduates as they begin college, as they begin work, as they begin life anew. That God is with them, that they have found wisdom, that they continue to follow the ways that they have been taught. We need to leave the church knowing that we are the church. We need to go out from these walls each and every day knowing that we are called to a greater task. That task is serving a loving, living God, Jesus Christ. That's it. That's our goal. And we need to go from here standing firm, standing strong, knowing that is what we are called to. But we need to do it together. So my encouragement today is to get in the huddle. And when we huddle up on Sunday morning, we share stories of victory. We saw people saved in faith. We saw people healed. We saw God work in our lives. We need to share stories of pain. We say, I'm having a bad week. I'm down for this. I've got this going on. I'm not sure how to handle that. And when we come together, we need to remind each other that we're praying together for each other, for the family of faith. And when we part, when we walk out those red doors back there, we need to write it on our hearts that we pray daily for each other while we're apart. That we pray for those things that Paul listed. That we pray for wisdom. That we pray for hope. That we pray for enlightenment. That we pray for God's power in each other's lives. So that when we get back together, be it in seven days or longer or closer, we can read it fresh and renew. The football teams go out in the fields and they run plays. They get back together in a huddle. Part of that is to call the next play, but part of that is also to pick each other up. <clears throat> in a championship game years ago, Ben Roethlisberger said after the game when Bettis crossed the goal line at the end, he said, what'd you tell him? He said, I looked at him, I said, you're the biggest guy on the field, you're going to get across that goal line. It was encouragement. It was getting him the ball and saying, I know no matter what, you're going to score on this play because we need to. We need to encourage one another. We need to lift each other up. Tonight, before the game starts, you'll see the teams huddled up. One bench is going to be black and gold, and one bench is going to be wishing they could hold on for just a second longer. But as they huddle up, they're going to be encouraging one another. Mike Sullivan has changed the Pittsburgh Penguins hockey franchise because he has taught the believe team to believe that they are better than any team they face on the ice. And that they're never out of it, they're always in it. Friends, that's what God has given us. Jesus Christ came into this family of faith and raised us up and taught us that we are better than any team on the ice because we have the best coach in the world. Jesus Christ is always with us. He is always encouraging. He is always lifting. So today as we leave here, as we go from this place, remember to pray for one another. Pray for your church. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for those that we haven't met yet. That God is at work in their lives. And that in all and through all, he sees them through every task that they face. Let us pray. Dear Father, we come to you today and pray that you be with us and guide us. Dear Father, you would carry us. Lord, we need to pray for one another. We go out and we each face the world in different arenas every single day. We're each thrown different challenges. We each have to mount different mountains. Father, sometimes we're all in different valleys. But Lord, in and through all your prayers, travel the distance. We pray, Father, today as we leave this place that you would help this family of faith to be strengthened. That as our graduates go from here and they go off into their next challenge in life, that we would be with them and guide them in prayer. That, Father, you would see them through in and all everything they attack. That, Father, for our family that is gathered, that as we go back to work tomorrow, as we go to the stores, as we go to our families, that, Father, we would remember to pray for each other. 
that in every situation we face, no matter what it is, that you are there. That we see your hope, that we understand your wisdom, that we're enlightened to the task you have for us. And that, Father, in the end, you give us your power, your strength, your excitement to go out and share your gospel of grace with those who we meet. Father, today we thank you for the gift of family here. Pray that you guide us. We pray. Amen. If you would, please stand.